it's me Mr. Voice back with a new video so this video is about how to design high current electrosynthesis cells like chlorate cells perchlorate cells when you run anything higher than 20 amps maybe 50 amps you're gonna need to cool that thing because if you don't cool it well then you're gonna have problems with your electrodes or process sometimes you might even want to heat it up it all depends on you but basically I'm basically saying that you're gonna have to uh, model your process and this video is for those people who want to know the ins and outs of going about it so you're probably wondering why exactly do we need to do this stuff well one your electrodes are gonna be happy because it will prolong their lifetime both because the temperature is within its operating range and because the pH will be controlled if you're doing the pH controlled process. pH control, by the way, requires 60 degrees Celsius or higher, so building such a reactor will help you dial in that temperature because you'll be able to transfer only just as much as you need which will allow you to essentially be able to somewhat control the temperature based on the flow rate that you provide to your, you know, jacket. Or if you're doing a water bath, you can decide whether or not to do a water bath or change the immersion depth. And this thing is very important for anything greater than 20 amps in terms of uh, power input to the uh, cell. It's it's a requirement at 40 amps or greater you actually need some sort of uh, active cooling so this flow sheet over here it may look like it's only a specific one but this is actually a general you know diagram for the heat flow of the system I didn't really label it right but basically as mentioned you have a reservoir you have your cell or jacket jacketed reactor whatever you want to call it and you have your radiator or cooling solution you know over here it shows a circulation of water throughout and the heat loss finally at the radiator but see this radiator could literally be the evaporative losses from the tank itself if this were instead immersed into the reservoir and there is no actual jacket and there might just be a pump just circulating water I like to do that a lot because it's quite good you know whether or not you have a radiator you know that's up to you but it all depends on how many amps you're putting in if you're putting in a lot of current then I would invest in a radiator if if not then you could use like a double pipe heat exchanger literally that literally means a Liebig condenser you could literally use that or you could use copper coils or anything really it doesn't even have to be glass it can be metal since we're pumping in jacket uh, solution and not the actual electrolyte so this diagram just really shows the general flow of heat in the system where it's you know it's generated at the electrodes gets transferred to the walls gets transferred to the cooling fluid and wherever the hell this cooling fluid goes that's where the heat finally goes i mean realistically in all steps heat flows out of the system but over here i'm showing that it's flowing out of the radiator because uh it's a representation of what's actually going on anyway let's move on now we're going to talk about the different types of setups and how they compare so jacketed reactors they require good flow rate unless you want to deal with uh certain calculations that will go down the line later water bath cooled simple construction but it's very bulky but it's very effective i use this one a lot immersed cooling coils has the highest heat transfer coefficient because you're using metal to transfer heat you know it can also help in a <laughs> minimizing the reactor volume if you want like a very small cell that runs 40 amps you will need immersed cooling coils because the volume totally depends on the surface area 
of the uh, container itself. And you know, that surface area denotes heat transfer. So if you have a cooling coil, you will have even more heat transfer. The only problem is it is complicated, so yeah. So, we're gonna talk about different types of heat exchangers here. So there are radiators. These, you can get these from mini fridges and computer parts. Depending on whether you get them new or used, they're either expensive or cheap. They have very high cooling capacity, so I'd use them so you don't have to worry about calculating the other values of Q. Cooling coils. As mentioned earlier, they're very good because they're made of metal. But you need cathodic protection to make them worth your time. Unless you only plan to pass the, you know, you don't have them in contact with the solution of the electrolyte, but instead just use them as a air to coolant heat exchanger then it's okay you can you can use them cooling towers you, know, you get a bunch of fins made of cardboard you just get a pump and, and 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 a fan and that's actually a very good cooling solution literally just make sure to add some fungicide into your uh cardboard cooling tower because uh you don't want that thing getting moldy i mean for storage rather lab condensers lab condensers I mean you are already using them so you might as well use them as a heat exchanger they work pretty well and passive evaporative cooling hey if you're using a bucket to like contain your cell and there's enough surface area on the top and enough wind blowing over it then that works too that will also bleed off the watts so yeah, these are the types of heat exchangers that you could be using. Now, we're going to talk about cooling tower construction. You can simply use cardboard, you know. You don't have to get metal fins because the whole point is you blow some air into some water with surface area and then you can cool down whatever it is you're cooling. So you would get your reservoir and instead of using a heat exchanger, just drip it onto this cardboard that you can buy from Amazon and put a fan on it. You can put this in a box. Just make sure it's not swimming. You know, it's like building a garden fountain. You gotta keep it flowing, but you can't let it pool out because it's gonna look like crap. And it's also good if you have some means to distribute it evenly across the cardboard like a pipe with holes on it like act like a sprinkler and the fan can either be from like one end that's blowing water and then at the very bottom you can have a drain pipe which and a pump which pumps it back to the cell now if you put the cooling water higher than the reservoir then you don't need a return pipe for that at all because you know gravity you can even in fact Put the cooling cardboard like suspended in the reservoir and simply like just like right slightly above it or even horizontally above it so that you know you have the inlet or the outlet pump of the cell you know when when you're what when the inlet puts uh when you pump water through the cell the outlet can just trickle on to the uh cooling cardboard and you can have a fan blowing to uh, exchange fluids and doing this can save a lot of space so if you want specific videos on specific DIY constructions of heat exchangers and cooling towers that's sadly for another video this mainly talks about the idea it's up to you guys to think of the design but don't worry I'll cover design in another video Next, we go to the very important bit. We're going to talk about jacketed slash water bath reactor designs. So as mentioned, we're trying to ultimately, this is the main device over here. So I made this by literally cutting two jars, slamming them together, and then epoxying them at the seams. And then I can just drop in my bamboo lid plastic container into this. And I can just feed water through it. Although this was a very shitty prototype, I have then since improved. Anyway, the most important equations for designing a jacketed water bath reactor. 
is well of course we're not going to talk about the chemical you know the uh, reaction rates or anything like that we're mostly talking about heat transfer so for our case it's electrochemical most of the heat instead of it being heat of reaction well it's kind of included thanks to that v0 term our equation for uh heat loss to the system or heat that heats up your liquid and not carries out the reaction is v minus v0 into i so v is your operating voltage usually run like 5 4.3 4.2 5.5 your V0 totally depends on your electrode and also your process. Like if you're doing pH control, your it's the chlorine evolution potential you have to pay attention to. For iridium ruthenium, that's 0 0.8 volts. And for iridium tantalum, it's 1.1 volts. By the way, I got these numbers from, from uh, Alibaba. That's what it states in their uh, data sheet. For oxygen evolution, iridium ruthenium and iridium tantalum both have 1.5 volts, while lead dioxide has 1.9 to 2.3, and it varies a lot depending on the dopants. These make a big factor, because uh, the uh, the evolution potential actually dictates how much heat is being used up in. Uh, the chemical reaction versus how much heat is just being wasted to the system you know so anyway regardless of that what you do is you just subtract 5 volts from any of these voltages over here then multiply it by your current and that's how many heats you have to remove to maintain the temperature difference now that goes on to our next equation which will denote that Q is equal to Ka delta t by delta x that delta t is just the temperature difference that you want you know that the uh, cell operates for instance for chlorates it's like 60 degrees minimum 75 degrees ideal so you put 75 minus you know usually the cooling water would stay at around 40 to 50 just pick a number and see if it fits your design constraints you know a is the surface area of your uh, reactor, basically the outer surface area of your uh, material that you're passing water through. So, you know, that will also determine whether or not it is possible to have enough heat transfer to cool it sufficiently. And delta X is just the thickness of your... Uh, bamboo lid borosilicate glass jar and k is the thermal conductivity of glass which is usually 0 0.8 watts per meter kelvin by the way when you're calculating this please convert units otherwise it's wrong anyway that's the area of the reactors again 2 pi rl plus pi r squared but the pi r squared really only matters if you're if the bottom is like not is in contact with the fluid if it's literally not in contact with the fluid which it usually isn't you just kind of ignore that term and it's just 2 pi rl and yeah as mentioned you have to denote the temperature difference depending on what uh, process you're doing because like what if you're doing it'll talk about that later anyway so yeah let's move on so for those of you that still don't get it, here's a better way to visualize it. I'll give you some real numbers to run. So, let's say you had a container that's 6 centimeters wide and 20 centimeters tall. The liquid inside goes up to the 17 centimeter mark of the cylinder. The container has a thickness of 2 millimeters. And we know the glass thermal conductivity is 0.8 watts per meter Kelvin. The container is in a water bath with a height of the outer liquid equal to the inner liquid. So the immersion depth is the same. So we ignore that. The temperature difference from the inner wall to the outer wall is 77 and 40 degrees Celsius. After knowing all this, <clears throat> we can fill in that equation below, literally. And the only thing you need to do 
is to check if this Q value is greater than our previous Q value. You know? AKA, we need to make sure that this Q value is the bigger one. Because otherwise, it means we're at capacity. And it can be like 1.5 to 2 times as big. Although most likely, in my experience with these cells, it's gonna be very close to 1. Which is scary. You know, the only way to fix that is to use a cooling tower to cool down the water so that the uh, temperature difference between the cell, which is around 70, and the cooling water can be a lot less. In fact, it's gonna go about to as low as your room temperature in an ideal case, but that that's very unlikely. Just give it plus 10 degrees to your room temperature if you're using a cooling tower or radiator. I mean, and if your Q is not smaller than than your Q from from voltage and current, then or if your Q is a lot smaller, yeah, if your Q is smaller than than the Q that's produced by the electricity, well, you got a problem. You're gonna have to get a bigger container because this ultimately is the crux of your system whether or not you can transfer enough heat from the jacket to the rest of the system because that's all that matters here so guys as you can see i'm kind of transparent right now anyway these are the applications to the uh the reason why we're even making this video in the first place so for chloride cells we know that the ideal operating temperature is 75 but we have a minimum operating temperature of 60 degrees now that's that's really good because we can adjust the temperature of the coolant by the flow rate although i said that ideally the temperature of the coolant water is less than or equal to 40 celsius it can actually be closer to the actual cell temperature because you see the, the more flow rate you put in the the more the temperature is gonna drop so in fact you know it can as long as your cell is not at 85 celsius or something it's completely fine but it cannot go below 60 so that's why it's still important to build a jacketed reactor heck you can even not put anything in there and in fact insulate it so that your temperature will be above 60 for the uh sweet increase in efficiency by almost two times it's actually 1.7 times faster than without ph control Anyway, speaking of non-pH control, the operating temperature has to be greater than 40 but less than 85. The temperature of the coolant water steady state is anywhere from 20 to 40 C. Current density 10 to 150 milliamps per centimeter squared. These two processes we talked about don't really have like a hard minimum current density. I just wrote 10 because it's sensible. If you're gonna run less than 10 what are you doing <laughs> what are you doing anyway now we go on to perchlorate cells and this is the problem you're gonna see why it's a problem you have so tight design constraints that you're gonna have to buy that cardboard from aliexpress if you're gonna build this on a budget and and still have something competent basically max operating temperature 55 degrees celsius ideal operating temperature 45 degrees celsius temperature of coolant water and this is very strict less than or equal to 30 degrees celsius knowing a room temperature is about 25 you're kind of screwed you only have like five de de degrees to play with before you know, and if, and if you're gonna run at the maximum operating temperature, maybe have a little more leeway. But, here's the other problem. The current density required to run a perchlorate cell is 150 milliamps per centimeter squared. Of course, running at 200 is better, but electrodes aren't gonna like it. So 150 is the best compromise for 60% efficiency instead of the wonderful 85. Anyway... The important thing of all of this is that the current density must be greater than 150. 
you know. And the fact that you have such tight conditions, heck, even a buddy of mine ended up putting his perchlorate cell in a bathtub because he needs to have all that to transfer heat. Although he could have just bought a cooling tower and a fan, you know, and, and the cooling tower, by that I literally mean a piece of cardboard or, or even rows of recycled cardboard. You don't need to buy the pre-made stuff. You can literally just buy some cardboard boxes, do a little bit of five-minute craps and glue gun them together and literally soak them at the top of your reservoir and put a fan. That's it. And you will be able to cool that thing down by like 20 degrees. It's really that effective. You know? Well, I'm blocking more text, but it's okay. I'll read that out for you. So, now, the next slides are going to be a bit scary because we're going to go into convective heat transfer. All of that's extra, and if you really want to bother, there are spreadsheets online. Maybe I'll make a spreadsheet on this if I get more support. Anyway, the only equations, as I mentioned, that really matter is just the Four years law of heat transfer for conduction and fucking Q equals V naught minus V times I. These are the only things that matter because you can just stick more pieces of cardboard if you don't have enough heat transfer surface area or you can just like, you know, use a bigger radiator. So really, that doesn't matter much because you're ultimately... We say bottlenecked? Yes, you're ultimately bottlenecked by your reaction chamber. You know, as mentioned, the, the thermal conductivity of your glass, the surface area of your glass, and the thickness. You change these parameters and you'll change your entire cell. The only exception is if you choose to use cathodically protected cooling coils. Then you can use the cedar tat equation. And find the fucking Nusat number and torture yourself for living hell. Or run enough fluids through it so it doesn't matter. And yeah, as mentioned, you can roughly check how many watch, um, watts a mini fridge uses along with the efficiency. And the temperature difference between the evaporator and the rear. It's at the back. Or just find out how much power it consumes. The next... Equations really only matter if you're designing your own radiator or or condenser or whatever the hell it may be. You know? Since now the last part I'm blocking, you know, the jacket is a very short pipe. And it's mostly in mixed flow conditions. And the cooling water around the the jacket is turbulent, along with the water in the cell being also in mixed flow and turbulent. You can treat everything as heat conduction. So the only heat transfer that really matters here is the heat transfer between the interior fluid touching the wall to the outside of the wall. And that's where we get the figure of 70 minus 40. That's all that freaking matters really. So anyway, let's move on. So. Now we're going to talk about radiator designs for convective heat transfers. This, you only need to do this if you, if you really want to design your own stuff or you just want to see how it all works. I'm just including it because why not? So the equation for convective heat transfer is HA temperature difference. And you're like, oh, that's nice. By the way, this temperature difference is the temperature difference between the fluid and the wall and not the temperature difference between whatever else. So if you remember, if you'd consider our jacket as a pipe, that would be the temperature difference between the wall and the fluid flowing through the pipe. But like I said, it's a very short pipe and there's almost, you know, not much, so it doesn't matter. And it's mostly gonna be conduction but if you're working with a very long pipe you know it's really long it's like a radiator and stuff then it's gonna be con convection because that's 
you know, you gotta push apart the fluids, am I right? Anyway, H is our overall heat transfer coefficient. A is our surface area of the inner pipe or outer pipe or whatever the hell. You can actually do it for both and it's, it's okay. It would be the inner pipe because you're going you're gonna to put fans and, and if you need more, you need more radiator or more fans. That part doesn't matter. So it's just considering the uh, heat transfer between the fluid flowing through the pipe. And we have the Reynolds number, which is uh, a factor for turbulence of flow, which is given by the pipe diameter times the velocity, the density divided by the vis uh, divided by the viscosity. Yeah. Then you have the Prandtl number, which is the heat capacity of the fluid multiplied by the viscosity divided by the thermal conductivity of the fluid. And our heat transfer coefficient is the Nusselt number multiplied by the diameter of the pipe divided by the thermal conductivity of the fluid. You know? Now you see, it may look simple. But I'm telling you, that Nusselt number is a piece of shit. It's like the worst thing ever. You will see. Exactly! What about the fucking Nusselt number? Anyway, this number, it can be found based on the flow conditions inside the pipe of the radiator. Whether you're flowing water like a slow poke, you're gonna have to use the Gnirniski correction for the Sidortat or Ditas Bolter equation, whatever. It's it's all derived from that one equation by Ditas Bolter. Then Sidortat made changes and Gnirski made more changes. Anyway <laughs> The equations below work at different ranges of of Reynolds number. So if you really want to use the simpler equation, which is the Sidortat, you need to just push the fluid faster in the pipe so you don't have to worry about the other crap. You know? Because that would suck. Friction factor is obtained in a table from the next page. Oh boy. Yes, and all of these can be obtained from spreadsheets. Now these formulas, yeah, you can you can let them sink into your head if you so desire. But you can just get some DWSIM or something and you do not have to deal with this as much. Although I still think you might need the value for H, so technically you're gonna need that along with a spreadsheet calculator. Unless it can somehow be simulated somewhere else in that software. I don't use it that much, so I don't know. Now, we're going to be talking about pipe roughness, because it matters. With, 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 you know, if you're, if you're going through laminar flow, aka you can't push too much water through the pipes because they're so damn thin, then you're going to have to wander through this hell and basically find out the friction factor so you can put it in the Gnielski equation. And you get it from the Moody diagram below which shows you the friction factor of the stuff of the pipe or, or was it the fluid whatever yeah it's a it's a fluid the friction factor of the fluid with the walls of the pipe due to roughness because pipes are not smooth they have bumps and this roughness factor is affected by turbulence. In laminar flow, we have a very linear relationship between the friction factor and the pipe, no matter how shaggy that pipe is. But once it gets turbulent, the shaggier your pipe, as you can see, the worse your friction factor can be. In fact, even worse than it was laminar flow, because a lot of roughness can create eddy currents and all kinds of wake field whatever crap it's all fluid dynamics that will lead to mechanical losses and also heat generation even and that's why the friction factor gets 
way worse when your pipes are rough. And we have this table down below showing all kinds of rough pipes. If there's concrete covering your pipe, well, that's going to be a 0 0.25 in your rough... 0 0.25, and that's way above this. You're basically fucked. If it's new smooth concrete, it's at least decent. And if it's something really nice, like a pipe that's made of Teflon, then, then you're, you know, you're, you're well in your way to the very bottom of this graph. You don't have to worry about it so much, but you still do. Anyway, next slide. Yep. And we're done. As you can see, Pichu sending you up. Anywhere we go, so you know, so we're willing. Anywhere we go, so you know, so we're willing. Anywhere we go, so you know, so we're willing.